Shalom, mm -hmm. brothers and sisters. I'd like to start today by opening with a prayer. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank Thee that we have this opportunity to worship together with one another, to hear Thy words and to feel Thy Spirit. We thank Thee for the technology which You provided us with, that we may reach out to one another across great distances to feel thy love and thy spirit and testify openly to one another of your reality, of Christ's grace, and all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Father, we ask thee that you will be with us this day that your presence will be felt in our homes and in our hearts, that the messenger, myself, will be blessed to speak spirit to spirit. For these are not my words. Fill me with the Holy Spirit that I will testify of you and fill the, those listening with the Holy Spirit, that they too will know of thee. Please help us with this thy work, that we may make the earth as it is in heaven, and that thy will will be done. These things we ask in the name of thy Son, even Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we talk about the second principle of Mormon Kabbalah. The first, of course, is that God is real. The second is that God is good. God is all bestowing and all giving, opposite of man, his fallen creation. Bad things don't happen to good people because God is unjust, but because the creation isn't yet completed. To us as Christians, the idea that God is good is pretty much just generally understood. So why does it need to be expressed? Well, it's much like the first one. We have to understand that God is good, just like we have to understand that he exists. And it's hard to explain to someone who hasn't felt the presence of God why he's good or that he's good. I believe I spoke last time about the fact that some people believe that when bad things happen, that's proof that there is no God. I believe and I testify that when bad things happen, that's an opportunity for us to develop a closer relationship with God, to know God on a deeper level. I don't believe that bad things happen to punish us or to teach us a lesson necessarily. I do believe in consequences of action. And that doesn't always mean that the consequences are deserved or just. But if I throw a ball against the wall, it's either going to bounce off or it's going to damage the wall. Maybe both. That's how physics works. The real world is the same way. Would God be a loving God if he, if he protected us so greatly that we couldn't make mistakes? Think about that for a second. What would life be like if there were no consequences to our actions? That could be as simple as if I take something that doesn't belong to me, there's no consequences, all the way to if I kill someone, there's no consequences. Can you even imagine a world like that? To me, it seems like it wouldn't be a paradise. It would be a chaos. How would we learn to keep our emotions in check? Anger would run rampant. We would think we deserved everything that we got without earning anything. Remember, we're finite beings. We don't see the world or the universe the same way that God does. 
We don't have that infinite knowledge, that infinite capacity. I want to share a scripture from... I can get it here. A scripture here from the first epistle of John, chapter 1, verse 5. This, then, is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. No darkness at all. What does that mean? He's light. He's light and there's no darkness. Does that mean that sometimes good things are going to happen and that's part of the plan? Does that mean that bad things are going to happen and sometimes that's a part of the plan? I will testify of this. There is always a plan. We may not understand it. And we may not appreciate it. But it still exists. The plan is still there. It is still in action. It is still in motion. From the moment the creation, from, excuse me, from the moment the creation began until the final resurrection, when the work is completed, everything is planned. Does this mean we don't have free will? Of course not. Who knows us better than God? God doesn't have to take away our free agency or our free will in order to ensure the things that he needs or wants to happen are going to happen. He can calculate accordingly. He knows our choices before we do. He's omnipotent. So what is the point then? Why does God let bad things happen? We look around the world, we see disaster, we see hunger, famine, abuse, just terrible things. I had someone recently tell me they believe that this world was hell because it's just such a horrible, horrible place. It's hard to imagine anything worse than this. How can a loving God send us to such a place? What's our role? What is our role in the creation? It's to make earth heaven. Now, that doesn't mean we go around forcing people to do the right thing. We can't make laws, we can't make regulations that make people good. It just, it won't work. We are independent creatures. We think for ourselves. Laws are passed to punish people who are bad, but not to force people or convince people to be good. So how do we do this? How does a loving God set up a plan where we, the finite people, are going to bring heaven to earth? Is that even possible? I believe it is. I don't believe that God has given us anything that we can't handle or we can't do. I do believe genuinely that God is good. I believe that people are good. I believe that we have bad days. I believe that we have unrighteous thoughts and sometimes take unrighteous dominion. But inherently, on some level, mankind in general is good. And I think that until we understand that, we have a harder time understanding that God is good. I'm going to read from the Book of Mormon. I'm using the OPV here. This is Moroni 7, which is going to be Moroni 7 in any Book of Mormon. Uh, but in the OPV, it is verse 13. But behold... That which is of God inviteth and enticeth to do good continually. That sounds similar to what John said, right? God is light. Therefore, everything which inviteth and enticeth to do good and to love God and to serve him is inspired of God.
everything. What does that mean? What is everything? If you're hearing a song on the radio and you feel the Holy Spirit testifying to you to do good, is that of God? It is. How can this be? How can it be that God uses things to show and testify of his goodness to us that aren't directly related? Some would say that the only thing that's good has to come from scriptures or hymns or from the mouths of living prophets. And yet we've seen horrible things come from all of these. People have used the Bible to excuse slavery. People have used the Book of Mormon to condone racism. This could be because they don't understand or it could be because they don't care. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. What does matter is that this is because we don't understand what God's word is. God's word is Jesus Christ. The true scriptures are written on our hearts. And if we don't have Christ, then the scriptures are meaningless. We can't understand them because we're holding words without having the word. Now, what does this have to do with God being good? It ties back directly to it. One of the things that we're trying to do here on earth is develop our relationship with God. Know God on a more personal level. How do we do this? How do we grow closer to our Savior, to our Father in Heaven, to the Holy Spirit? We have to have that word written, the scriptures, I'm sorry, we have to have the scriptures written in our hearts. We have to have our hearts pierced with the true prayer, being born again. We have to have the true word, which is Jesus Christ. By having these things, our perspective changes. Now, that doesn't mean we understand everything perfectly. It doesn't mean that we understand exactly why God does what he does or why he allows things to happen the way they happen. But with that perspective, we understand that there's more to it than that. It's deeper. We get a clearer focus and we can find the positive in the negative. That doesn't mean that all negatives will have a positive. But we can find comfort and solace in knowing that God does have a plan and that everything is going to work out in the end. It also changes our reasons for action. God's will is going to be done regardless. That's a fact. The question that we have to ask ourselves is, are we going to be a scalpel in the hands of the Lord or a blunt instrument that he uses to ensure that the tasks are completed? Because they will be completed. By understanding that God exists and that God is good and searching the true word, Christ, so that we can understand the written scripture through the filter of the true scripture in our hearts, by doing this, God's light will shine through us and transform the world. And this is the only way it's going to happen. It can't ha happen by us just going out and convincing people of things because that's temporary. 
I was talking to a preacher a couple decades ago, actually. He said he didn't know what the problem was. He, he preached hellfire and brimstone. And people would come up. He would call, do an altar call. People would raise their hands. They'd come up to the altar. They wanted to know Jesus. They wanted to not go to hell. And he said, you know, I scared the hell out of people. Why don't they come back? Because fear doesn't convert like love does. Because when they go home, the fear leaves them. The adrenaline leaves them. And what spirit do they have left? It's the spirit of love, unity, understanding. It's that light. These are the things that convert us. These are the things that transform us and our perception so that we, in turn, can allow God's light to shine forth in a humble way to transform the world. That is our role in the creation. In Genesis, we're told that we're to tend to the garden. That's this earth. We take care of it. It's our duty to make it a better place. The question is, how do we do that? How do we take care of one another? How do we love one another? If you want someone to know that God is love and that God is good, don't tell them. Show them. Show them by your words. Show them by your deeds. If God accepts us where we are, he accepted you where you are. Who are we not to accept others where they are and to love others as they are? We're not going to change them. But by loving them, they have an opportunity to allow Christ to change them. Remember what God told Moses. His purpose is to bring forth the immortality and eternal life of mankind, all of us. All of us. He didn't say of the Jews, the Israelites, of this people or that people. He said mankind, all of us. How did he do it? By the example we set. So that others know where to go when they feel that draw from the Spirit to come to Christ, to come to God, to repent, to walk the path of Teshuva, to return home. Brothers and sisters, I want to testify to you that God is good. Whatever pain, whatever hardships we're going through, turn them over to him because he has a plan and he has a way of helping you heal if you will let him. The atonement isn't just to forgive sins. It is also to comfort us and to heal us, to lighten our burdens, to lighten our loads. And what is, what is the covenant we've taken as we have become Christians? To mourn with those that mourn. Be there for others and allow others to be there for you. After all, we're all in this together.
That's my testimony to you today. I'll leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's close with the prayer. Father that art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we pray to you. Bring us comfort. Bring us strength. Help us to know of your goodness, your light, and your love. Bless us and help us to sharpen our scalpels, for we are your scalpels. Help us to clean our vessels that your light may shine forth from us and help transform this world. We can't do it alone. We can only do it through you. We can only do it through the atonement and the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. Bless us with the strength, the companionship, the brother and sisterhood, that we will not only find shalom in Christ, God's peace, Christ's peace, but we will embody it. It will pour from us into the world to transform it. All will know the source of the light and come unto thee and be transformed, that the world may be saved and corrected, become a paradise once again. These things we pray, that we will go forward in thee, and in thy name, to serve thee and strengthen one another. And this we will do, and this we ask, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless, brothers and sisters.
Thank you.